All right? And so this is, was created by Li Wa Lin. He's a resident wave guy that works with the Customer Research Program. Um, and so he put this together. This is essentially his model that we've added in to the coastal modeling system and work with. And so um, a little bit of information. I covered some of this on the first day. It just goes into a little bit more uh, detail and um, visualizing some of the results and the ways that it's been implemented um, throughout the number of years we've been using this. So it's um, kind of going over what the different uh, equations were, but I removed those just for this um, conversation um, and just going over a couple of, um, of the basics. So CMS Waves is a steady state model. Um, so what that means is you are um, computing the waves for one moment in time for the entire grid. So it's the way it does that is it starts on the offshore edge and then it calculates the values for that row and or column depending on how you're looking at it. And then that marches in towards the shoreline and the back of your base. Um, and then if needed, it will actually reverse compute and head back the other way if you have reflection turned on. Um, so that's basically how it works. It's pretty efficient. It works uh, either standalone or through a coupled effort with CMS Flow. You would still come into CMS and just run CMS with only a wave grid. It's how you would get um, just the waves to run by itself. Uh, if you want the interaction, you'll specify both of those, but we can go into that um, at the end of tomorrow or Friday um, at the beginning. So. The different capabilities for CMS Wave, we've got wave diffraction and reflection, um, breaking, bottom friction dissipation. Um, there's refraction in there as well. We have wind input that will initiate wave motion, and you have wave and current interaction, wave transmission at structures, so you can specify you know, some permeability at those structures or a height um, for a floating structure and some wave energy will actually go underneath it and around it. Um, wave run-up, overtop, overtopping, and overland flow uh, is kind of our buttons that you can push in the model control to turn on, uh, and it will calculate those values based on the depth and the energy that's moving in and actually go a little bit farther inland depending on the situation. Uh, variable grids. Um, so you can have a large wave grid and a smaller wave grid, and, uh, or a series of smaller wave grids. So it just depends on your area. Um, you don't necessarily want a lot of computational cells uh, everywhere, so that's one way we can run a larger grid and then use some of those results to force a smaller grid. And then there's the fast mode. Um, for doing a little bit faster calculations, and this goes into a little bit of how that's done uh, in the code and um, how it works. So again, some of the capabilities for uh, CMS Wave. Um, so a lot of other Wave models out there that have do similar things, um, but they're represented a little bit more simply. We have good uh, theory and formulas that are representing these particular ones that are outlined here, whereas other ones, other models are a little bit simpler um, in its calculation for those, or it's all um, parameterized, something like that. So we, we do a little bit better job in some areas for um, some of these different capabilities than other models. A little bit about the interface. This is just the model control. I'm not going to go into detail today because we're going to work on this tomorrow. But it's a page where you have pretty much everything that you need to um, model and set up. And another page that I'm not showing here is how you would set up the spectral energy. And you would tie that in in this area right here. I will go into this tomorrow afternoon. Um, and getting that spectrum we can gather that information from buoys 
whether it be NOAA, NBPC, or CBIP. Um, you can have gauges out there that can contain that information. Or you can actually, you know, go into the SMS and say, I want a wave height that is, you know, one meter high with this period and some other um, parameters onto it, and it'll calculate those uh, spectrums based on that theoretical spectrum and let you use that to force a grid with. Um, kind of a simplistic approach is looking at these things. This is one of those pre-calculated uh, ways. It's very symmetric, so you know it's just created. It's not a, a natural one. But you can visualize um, both the energy versus frequency and the energy versus direction um, inside the SMS. So you can kind of see what things look like, the different energies for the different wave characteristics before you actually run with them. We've got uh, JD Breakwater uh, capability in there. We have good dif diffraction and reflection. And so this is just one of the examples here. Um, at one time it was an animation, but we don't have that connected in right now. Uh, but it would show that this JD uh, and then the diffraction around the backside of that. Uh, so we do have those capabilities built in, and from the get-go, you don't have to turn in it on any switches, it's automatically there. There's newer capabilities added for infragravity type waves, uh, these long, long-term waves um, that are, they really come in and they reach a little bit farther back into the bay than normal waves do that really dissipate and dissipate. Um, are gone by the time you get back, get back here. So if you need those turned on, there's a, a switch in the interface to turn those on, and this kind of shows a little bit of our results. Turning it on, you get a little bit more energy, switch the back here and without it. We've done some testing in the different um, real-world situations for this. Wind wave generation, so as I mentioned, if you have just wind events, they can generate their own waves. And just a couple of graphs here of how we match up with some idealized cases. Um, and then we've also got um, wave cases that we've, well, wind cases that we've run um, that were real world cases as well. So there's different um, breaking formulas that you're able to use with CMS waves. There's Batches and Janssen, there's Goda, Nietzsche, there's a couple of others. Um, so the user has an option to select which one that they want to use or try a, a, an assortment of them in different situations and see what best fits um, the area that they're working in. A wave generation in Madagascar Bay, I kind of explained this on Monday, but basically we ran this case with just hurricane-type winds coming over a CMS wave. And the results that we got in comparison with actual wave uh, with measurements in the field, we did relatively well. The type of grids for um, CMS waves. Um, so for CMS flow, we have the Cartesian grids and we also have Quadri grids. For CMS wave, the only capability that's out there are Cartesian type grids. So that's either the variable um, rectangular cells or completely square for the entire grid. Um, these type of grids, there are no quantry grids available for CMS wave right now. I'm hoping we can change that in the future and bring those in. It'll actually save a lot of computation um, in the areas that we want it. But for right now, we're stuck with these two type of grids. Um, it's still not too bad. Um, you can have the larger cells out in the deeper ocean. It's just any resolution you add, like I mentioned the other day, gets extended all the way to the edge of the domain in both directions. Just some results from these. They look almost identical. Um, as long as you have appropriate number of cells identifying your inlet and your structures, then you should get pretty good um, correlation. Um, so you don't need all the square cells if you look how many cells this is. Uh, compared with this, we're getting pretty much identical answers on both sides. Grid nesting, I kind of mentioned this before, if you have a large regional area and you have a CMS wave grid that you've already developed, you can take that and run it with a certain 
um, spectra and then have output spectra for your smaller grid right here. And so when you're actually in production mode, you only need to be working from this smaller grid and not this entire large domain. So just another, uh, we have uh, regional wave generation, different uh, surges and everything with and without wind, and uh, the answers that you get. You can kind of see a little bit of this. Wave run up and some information about how it's calculated and how we, we work with it, and some um, comparisons with actual data. Um, but essentially, without run up, all the waves would stop right at the shoreline. But as we apply these waves to our actual flow grid, the energy will cause the waves to actually go onshore a little bit farther uh, distance. Floating breakwaters, I thought I had to remove this e equation. But basically, it's just one thing how they're uh, calculating it uh, for a floating breakwater. Um, and just a couple of examples of how we do this. So this is kind of some information about how things are stored in a file. Um, but we really don't need to know that with the interface handling all this for us. But essentially, we've got um, a platform here with a certain number of cells that can identify as um, just um, an island. And so as you see, the waves are coming in from this lower left-hand angle uh, corner and coming in. And they don't affect any of the cells that have been identified here. Um, but you do get energy around it quite a bit. And so the same setup is used for the next three different examples. But we've changed the structure types for these individual cells and given some parameters um, so that they're, they mimic certain structures. So right here, we have uh, the same setup, except we've identified these as a floating breakwater. So we've input the, the depth for this to be 10 meters. Um, and we've got a draft of 2 meters. And so basically, we're getting some energy that's actually going underneath and through this. And it's much smaller. Um, but it's not zero like it was in the previous um, setup. Similarly, we have a platform. Um, so we have an elevation now instead of being floating. And so it's a meter above the water level. And so we do get some diffraction going on and some other energy transfer. Um, and you can see the sheltering behind the platform due to the waves coming around it. Then we have another one that's a little submerged. So it's actually two meters deep. And you see what's going on. You get some uh, flow over top of it. And actually a little build up on this edge and sheltering behind it. So we, we have a few different of those structure types. And you can set those up. We're not necessarily going to go over all of those tomorrow. Uh, so we've only got two hours, but we will cover that in a later time in an advanced webinar. Just a little, a few uh, little graphs here of some experiments that we've done in the past in comparison, um, comparing different wave breaking and transmission coefficients and how CMS waves did in correlation with the actual results from the, the experiments. Another flume type of the talking test that we did. Um, we measured, we had some measurements here. We actually compare some results from uh, CMS waves. So this was an animation at one time. I kind of showed this, but um, I don't have that in here right now. And again, the calculations and comparisons with over, for overtopping with some ex experiments. I mentioned a little bit about this yesterday, the muddy coast and the different dissipation that we get um, with mud than, we, than if it was with sand only. So we identify in the wave grid a certain area as being a mud area, and we give it a coefficient associated with that. Um, and then the rest of the grid has um, the default coefficient for dissipation. And 
as we are uh, running the case, you can kind of see um, what the wave height and the period looks like over these different areas, and then the comparison of with measurements here as well. So the fast mode, um, I mentioned yesterday, the other day, so basically, um, normally we run CMS wave spectra with 35 directional bins, so it has 30 frequency bins, 35 directional bins, so if you multiply that out, um, you, you get a certain number. And so what fast mode does is it reduces the directional bins from 35 down to either 5, between 5 and 7, depending on the energy that it finds in your spectrum. And so it removes, it combines the energy for those bins into a fewer number. So there's fewer grid, I mean, grid cells in your spectral grid that you're actually having to calculate. And so it speeds up your calculations by five to seven times. Um, if you do the division, five into 35 or seven into 35. So it really has a chance to speed up the, um, the time that it takes to run each wave criteria and then it doesn't necessarily take away much from the user. Um, here's a couple of examples. On the left we have the standard run with the 30 by 35 directional frequency bins. And then the answer with a fast mode turned on where it merged those directional bins and you see um, a little bit of difference. Most of it is pretty much all the same. There's a little bit difference as you get into the day uh, at the back end of this. You can see a little bit less energy here. Um, but if you're looking at the overall and you're just trying to get a quick answer, this is a much better way to do it than waiting seven to five to seven times longer for the actual answers um, if you're, you're in a rush. So we can kind of look this and get an approximate answer. Um, once we get everything situated and we're ready to push the button to go into full production mode, then we'll switch it back from fast mode into the normal uh, calculating mode, and then we'll run it um, at the very end with all the frequency and directional bins. And as we alluded to, we have the capability of merging or coupling the wave action with what's going on in the flow model. And so uh, essentially how this works is uh, CMS wave will run time zero and time one, and then CMS flow will calculate hydrodynamics and sediment transport with those waves. Um, at the beginning and ending of a specified interval in between. And so that time zero and time one, that could be three hour period or a one hour period. Um, it's up to the user to define what that is. Um, and then CMS flow will calculate those three hours um, bookended with the waves on either end. And so the waves will slowly transition from one state to the second state over that interval uh, time. So we kind of see here that we've got a flow domain somatic order ship channel here. Uh, we zoom in, we see the, uh, the inlet here. We've got a, a wave grid that doesn't go quite as far back. Um, it stops pretty much right after the barrier island. Um, but then we are able to couple the information from the wave and the flow to get an answer for wave generated currents and uh, current modified waves, um, and it iterates back and forth passing in both directions uh, as we move forward with the total simulation time. And so with that extra wave energy I mentioned earlier, it has more energy in the flow model to pick up sediment and move it around. Um, here's a case where we have the mass of the, uh, or the, uh, we going to go to shipping channel, and we're running after 12 hours. We were able to see some breaching through here um, on both the north and the south side. It was with uh, category three. I'm not sure which one it was. Then. 
Um, we look at this, these answers in an oblique view, and we can see a little bit more about how these breaches were and the energy coming from the tower on the sides. Uh, Tombolo de development, I don't think that this um, animation will work, but over time, um, you see the breakwater here, you get a buildup of sediment in the backside in a T-type shape, or a point-type shape, and um, it's typical Tombolo, and we're able to reproduce that with CMS uh, using waves and flow.